And welcome. Welcome, everyone. I'm Chloe Karova, producer of the Logan Square book, LGNSQ. I've lived in Logan Square since 1997. I've lived here for over 20 years, and I thought I was just going to stay here for maybe five, seven years, but I'm still here because I love Logan Square. I love this, this diverse community, you know, but all at the same time, like for some of you who've been in the community, I see, I see Robert Castillo. Hey, um, <laughs> Rob's in the house. Um, many of you who've lived in the neighborhood for several decades, these longtime residents, you've seen a lot of changes like I have. And you recognize it's like, wow, it's like there are some things that maybe they're there, you know, we might lose some of these, some of these places, some of these buildings, some of the stuff that happens in our community. They're under threat. Well, that's certainly how it felt for me. So the project of the Logan Square book is really to sort of, you know, I want to, I want to, you know, um, just capture the like Logan Square before full transformation takes hold. Um, but also, you know, there's some people who've been in the neighborhood for a long time and maybe you've been waiting for this development to happen. You've been waiting for rapid, you've been, like, I think about the people in South Shore. They've been wanting gentrification <laughs> for 30 years. Okay? Never happened in South Shore. Some other communities envy what we have, but also other people, they're grieving, you know? They're, they feel like they've lost something or they, they could lose something. So I'm gonna stop talking and I'm gonna get into the book. So I'm sharing my screen with you guys. Um, everybody has access to this PDF. It's on the LGNSQ website. This is the agenda. We're gonna, um, I'm gonna turn things over to David Shaliel. He's one of the four photographers, David Shaliel, Jorg Metzner, Robin Marchant, and Severio Trulia. And then we're, all good. we're going to hear from Jorg, who is our street art photographer, Inez Bellina, who is a bilingual writer. She was interviewing people in English and Spanish. Yes. And let me tell you, and she also helped a lot with the translation, Henry Moya, who's also here somewhere, he also played a huge role in that. Uh, let me tell you, I don't know too many bilingual photography books. So I'm like, I'm going to make a bilingual photography book, you know, and I think it's going to be really cool. And I hope other people you know, make their, uh, you know, like think about making making um, their books bilingual and accessible to more audiences that way. And then also there's going to be some audience participation. So that's going to be at the end. I'm giving plenty of time for that. And for you guys, I trust that everybody is well behaved here. And I'm just going to let you just unmute your microphone, just like the Chicago Public Library. <laughs> you're just going to unmute it. And you're just going to say whatever it is that you got to say. And we're going to have a conversation. Quick reminder, this meeting is being recorded. It is being recorded. Okay, well, let's get into it. I'm gonna hand things over to David. David Shaliel is chair of the Department of Sociology. You guys can read faster than I could speak, but essentially what I want you guys to know is I think David is perhaps one of the best architecture photographers in the United States. He is, he really is. Yes, he is. I really do think that, <laughs> David. And I am not the only one. So it's very, very special, you know, to, to have him be part of this project and have him here tonight. So I'm going to hand things over to David. Sure, great. Well, hi, everyone. It's really nice to uh, be here and to get a chance to have this event at the Chicago Public Library, even if we are in this virtual space. Um, just so exciting to uh, be able to contribute to um, this, this really august institution uh, and its role that it plays in the neighborhood um, as a real focal point for you know uh, diverse communities to come together uh, and, and have meaningful conversations uh, and to create uh, meaningful connections. So it's really great to great to be here. Um, so as Chloe said, uh, my name is David Shaliel. Um, so I'm a, a visual sociologist. I'm a sociologist who makes photography, uh, photographic projects and film. And um, today I'm going to talk about three of my favorite 
images uh, from this from the series uh, that I made uh, while working on this project with this really amazing group of photographers, writers, designers, and others. So um, really, just it's a, a real pleasure to be part of the project. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm going to start with this um, this photograph, which is on the on the cover. And I, I know it seems like it must it must just be an obvious choice, um, but it really is the beginning of my relationship with Logan Square, and it was a favorite part of the project to me. Um, so I'm just going to pause for a second so we can just look at the photo for a moment and just kind of think about what's there. All right, so I'm going to jump back in, but we'll leave the photo up while I'm while I'm talking about it until we talk about the next image. And so, um, you know, so I live I live in Minneapolis now, but I lived in Chicago for uh, about 15 years. Um, and the way that I was introduced to Logan Square was through the Bloomingdale Trail, uh, the 606, of, you know, which this is a photograph. Um, and of course, it wasn't called the Bloomingdale Trail back in the early 2000s. Um, instead, it was you know like a semi-active, semi-derelict elevated freight line um, where, where so many people, my friends and I included, um, you know, would explore, have bonfires, um, hang out with whoever else happened to be up there. Um, and I've been advocating for a similar kind of project on the south side, uh, on the 40th Street Spur, uh, otherwise known for those of you who may be familiar with it, is, is known as the Kenwood Branch. Um, but the ultimate was really actively against it. Um, and so around 2009, I was approached by uh, Ben Helpen and some others with the Friends of the Bowmandale Trail to start doing some really kind of quasi official documentation of that whole 2.7 mile length of, of what we now know as the Bloomingdale Trail. Um, and so if the park project was ultimately going to happen, it would be really important to document the trail as it was. Um, and so I regularly worked on that project until the construction began in earnest. And I've, you know, I've, I've stopped by, you know, repeatedly um, and really regularly since then. Um, and so for me, this image is really the perfect starting point for this project. You know, my converse with my, in my conversations with residents uh, about the things that define the community, the Bloomingdale Trail came up again and again. And so I really see that uh, the Bloomingdale Trail then as uniting this sort of longstanding work that I've been doing since the early 2000s, um, you know, on the Bloomingdale trail or what it is now um, and this work with the Logan Square uh, book project and so together I really think about you know those memories those actions the things that you know sort of establish the connection that I have with the neighborhood and the surroundings and so you know so this photograph is this this image of the trail um, and in part for the image that it is in part for what it represents um, as for what it is I, I hope you all find it to be a dynamic image um, you know but also has so much of the Chicago of now right so there's the passing L the guys riding the divvy bikes together, um, you know, the way that vegetation is filling in, that lush sky. Um, and, and so I really wanted to invite people into the scene, um, but also make clear that there, there is this clear investment in this place, you know, this investment in the trail. And there's also the new construction that's abutting those former tracks. Um, and so, of course, the, the, the sort of the story of the Bloomingdale Trail is, is one of change in the community. And there are real concerns about how introducing a new asset like this contributes to rising rents, to rising taxes, to displacement. Um, in, in, in particularly in a part of the city that was already famous for those things before the trail even opened. Um, and so, you know, I'll say more about that in a bit, but, but in a way the image is then also an excellent way into the project, right? So places are political and the Bloomingdale Trail is clearly a politicized space. Okay, so for the second image, we can jump over there. Um, so I, I've selected this photograph of the freeze. Um, and, and again, um, it's, it's for what this image is and also that it represents to the neighborhood uh, you know, that, I, that I share with you now. Um, and so again, let me, let me pause for a moment here. Of course, we can see the way the photograph looks uh, in, the, in the spread uh, laid out in the book. So just pause for a minute here. So, so, so much about what was exciting to me about this project was getting a chance to visit places that residents told us were meaningful to them. Um, and then trying to make an image that contributed at least, or you know, that some of that feeling. <laughs> um, and so while I really enjoyed doing a lot of the interior work that I was doing. And so these would be things like the church interiors that start on page 36, if you've got the book, um, or my time in the Latin American Motor Motorcycle, Association, Motorcycle Association, so in their club. Um, so much of the neighborhood wasn't just those interior spaces, right? 
in those dynamics. And instead, so much of it was really about how it's seen and how places of sociability, like these places where people can connect with each other, um, are really interwoven into that overall urban landscape that are interwoven into the community. And the freeze just exudes <laughs> that kind of like su summer evening feeling. And so I'm excited I was able to ca capture something of the magic of the freeze with this shot. And so it, you know, it tells you a little bit of my working process too, because I photographed the, you know, the, the, the place like several times in so many different ways before settling on this particular photograph on this particular summer evening. And you know, for every photograph, there are always you know alternates, right? So multiple images that I'm making. Um, but 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 I mean here that I'm always hoping to find really the right time to photograph something, right? In this case, I was really trying to think about how to bring out that like nostalgia, how to bring out those memories, how to bring out the mood, and how to do that through color. Um, and so on regular evenings, everything looked really good, but it didn't look like how it felt or how the neighborhood residents explained like the warmth and the excitement of how it felt. And so the solution that I came up with was to sort of wait until there was an afternoon rainstorm. Um, and so that, you know, like why? It's because everything glows then, right? So instead of thinking about the ground being this like black, you know, like dark black top, it becomes yet another radiant source of color that matches the sky. And that kind of color seemed really important based on the kinds of memories that people have of it. Um, and so it's about how that image conveys that mood that I heard in those resident conversations and not just what it looks like on any particular day, right? Um, so finally, I want to include one more image. And so this is a photograph from uh, pages 24 and 25. Um, and again, I'll, I'll pause for a moment here. So, you know, I mean, thinking of stories, I mean, there are so many great stories of the neighborhood of Logan Square, um, but, but one of the stories that's really dominant is that, that, that story of community change and gentrification. And of course, you know, like the contrast is one of the things that I really like about the image and what that contrast says. Um, it's an area, you know, the area around Micah is an area that I knew I wanted to photograph from the very beginning. Um, and I literally, you know, I spent, I don't know how many days circumnavigating those, these new buildings. And so just look, looking everywhere I could go, trying to get up on the backs of buildings, talking to people about other views from their houses, um, actually getting a chance to go into people's homes in order to get these different kinds of views of it. Um, and I was trying to figure out what orientation most clearly expressed the kind of change um, that was going on in the neighborhood. And <clears throat> other buildings were clear examples of how like the direct streetscape of residential buildings were changing. And there are examples of that in the book. Um, but this one seemed to work on a different level because of all of the details. And so here I think about like, you know, the Chevy van, um, but with uh, that also, and it's a little hard to tell on the screen probably, but it has Puerto Rican flags on it. Um, there's this unmaintained rear section of the buildings. There's the utility corridor. Um, there's the iconic L. Um, there's that bright, but still kind of like mass oriented restaurant in the foreground, or not quite foreground, but kind of mid ground. Um, and there's all the new construction towering over it all, right? And so it's got the bold banner inviting prospective residents, you know, to check out the website for it. And then of course you can see that the building is also occupied. And so those ideals to me, or idea, those details to me were more really, really illustrate the complexity of the changes in the neighborhood. Um, so sort of seeing what is, what was, what will be, what might be. Um, and that all that exists at once in one image and one scene um, suggests that we really have a role still in shaping that future. And so I hope people see these images as a kind of record of their record of their and my perspective on the neighborhood, but also as a way to frame a conversation about what the neighborhood is uh, and what the various groups who comprise the neighborhood, what they really want. Um, and so, you know, I, I'll, I'll leave with that parting thought of thinking about what these images can do, what the book can do, um, and how we can make Make it uh, not just be an object, right, but really a, a living thing that is part of our community and part of our conversations. Yeah, this image is one of my favorite images in the book because, as David mentions, like it has that tension now for people who live or you're nearby or you know Milwaukee Ave, the, the California Blue Line stop is your stop. You know that Milwaukee Avenue is a discount shopper destination. We've got a family dollar there. Victory Grill. This is where teenagers hang out. Right, and so we have you know this new construction, these these towers, and then but they're facing 
a dollar tree, <laughs> you know, a family dollar. And so it's really interesting. But for some people, you know, maybe like this is sort of like what we should aspire to having both high income or, you know, upper income people and then low income. For some people, that's a definition of diversity. And why don't we just keep it that way, right? It doesn't have to be all discount and all, you know, high end. And so my feeling is like, whoa, I would love it if we just keep it this way. Can't we just have like serve both segments, right? Keep my thrift stores, please. <laughs> <You know? laughs> keep my dollar stores. Well, that was great, David. There's going to be time for, um, for people to give their feedback at the end. Now I'm going to hand over to Jorg. So Jorg was our street art and there's a very, very substantial section in the book. Uh, Jorg has contributed to, which is about street art and random stuff. And we've got a very, very rich culture in Logan Square of public art. It's everywhere. It's in this photo here, but I'm going to hand it over to Jorg now. So this is Jorg Metzner. Hi, I'm uh, Jorg Metzner and I'm uh, a photographer. Uh, I live in Evanston, but uh, spend lots of time in, in Chicago. Uh, uh, really enjoyed spending this entire year um, roaming Logan Square. Uh, and, 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 and I, I had prior to this project, I already often would ride my bike down through the neighborhoods and, and um, take photos. And the, uh, the art is, is just incredible. It's, it's everywhere. And there's, there's tons of surprises. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll jump right in with this uh, image here uh, from Miss uh, Chia FTR. Um, Wonderful. Uh, I mean, that, that was, I, I have so many images from, from this year of uh, photographing Logan Square, um, but this was an easy choice for this presentation. Um, so if you, if you zoom in to the, uh, the other part uh, where we can see the viaduct, so that's, that's underneath the Bloomingdale Trail where, where David had just talked about the Bloomingdale Trail. This is what's underneath it. It's, it's a very dingy, uh, um, kind of dirty uh, section of the street. Uh, but, but this art is just bringing in some, some love and care and, and, uh, and wherever you go, something just peeks out at you and it's, it's uh, celebrating culture, it's celebrating the neighborhood. Um, it's it's not just some. Uh, it's it's very purposeful there, uh, clearly. Uh, this is a, a women's wall down there um, uh, with all women artists, and then uh, along the whole uh, Bloomingdale Trail, there's the uh, graffiti garden, and. Uh, the team did a great job documenting and writing about all the artists and 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 all the different sections uh, of of art that you can find just there. But it's it's all over, and um, so I, I spend a lot of time there. This is this is some, some of it is uh, sanctioned art uh, organized by different uh, groups by activists, by um, artists getting together. Uh, it's really the community uh, making itself seen, uh, expressing uh, what they feel uh, their neighborhood should, should be like. Um, and, and it was just incredible photographing, um, getting to photograph all of that. Uh, the next image, the um, uh, Jason Brammer, yeah. yeah, Jason Brammer. He has a, a couple murals uh, throughout Logan Square, and uh, it's just such a fun image. The juxtaposition of the octopod. Um, uh, it's the title of the uh, image. Uh, with with that uh, porch in front. There's a lot of that, and and I think it it really does. Uh, bring the neighborhood to life and and uh, it, it creates again surprises and brings in color. Um, 
it's just joy. You wait for a bus, you, you, you get to look at this. Uh, I, think, I think it makes a huge difference. Now, um, the reason why I chose this as the second image is it, it is a part of a, another category of art that you will find throughout the neighborhood where it's art and commerce starting to, to mix. This is a commission piece by the uh, Boiler Room Pizza Pizzeria uh, on which Waldis is painted. And uh, I think Pops Gurren chipped in on this one. They, they commissioned Jason. And um, and I think that's that's fine, but it, it, it starts touching upon the, um, you know, artists need to make a living. We want, we want them <laughs> to, uh, to be able to do this full time. Uh, so so uh, it, it touches upon the um, gentrification aspect, right? So so this is this is it is on one side it is you know beautifying and and bringing fun to the neighborhood, expressing the the feel of the neighborhood. At the same time, somebody uh, hopes to you know that there's a little bit of return on investment, and and I think that's that's okay for for that local business. So it's a, it's a balancing act, right? So that that's what the book, a lot of the pictures in the book are are uh, talking about is um, the character of the neighborhood, people uh, expressing their feelings and 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 uh, claiming their neighborhood at the same time. There's development going on. This attracts people to the neighborhood that probably wouldn't have otherwise been attracted to it, and. There goes gentrification, so it's it's really uh, a juxtaposition of those two issues. And then the last is is part of the random stuff section of what I photographed, and boy, is there a lot of random stuff in Logan Square, and I mean that in the best possible way. I mean, <laughs> it's. And it's it's like an archaeological dig, right? You you can just there's so many layers there that you can peel through, and uh, uh, so this is by Jason. Uh, Don't lick my eyeball by Jason Sangster, uh, uh, a graphic artist who who has uh, a couple different projects uh, up at all times, and and um, this irreverent just. Uh, sentence half sentence just stops you in your tracks it, it made me laugh at the, um and and then you know you you will find all kinds of stickers for events for businesses for uh uh activist stickers for political uh issues um it it just it just runs the gamut and um you can't escape it. It's on the back of street signs. It's it's on 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 uh, on the newspaper boxes, on windows. Uh, uh, unfortunately, all the boarded up storefronts are just teeming with this. But it's it's like it's like the neighborhood talking. It's like it's like the neighborhood um, message board, uh, and and it's great. Uh, it's uh, it's again, I think, something that makes Logan Square very. Uh, uh, Logan Square. So uh, it, 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 it was just great to to look at these different layers and and then you start you know recognizing artists and and you find them in different spots and there there's just a lot and it's worthwhile to to pay attention to that. It makes you stop and it makes you think and, and um, it's it's all part of the conversation here. Yeah, I, I strongly recommend people you know, take a look at our, like spend some time, you know, in our street art chapter, because, you know, what we're trying to do, let me know if we're successful, please, we want your feedback. Because um, we're trying to take these random things and put them into a context. And the our, our feeling is, you know what, these stickers, this stuff that's just, maybe it seems kind of meaningless, um, it tells you, directly what a neighborhood is feeling right now. And all of this public art, it's, this is what Miss Chia, <laughs> one of the artists in the all woman wall says, you know what, these murals, they are a gift. They are a gift to the community. And maybe this is something that we want to preserve. Other people are gonna say, hey, you know what? For me, it's a sign of a neighborhood out of control. Put some brown paint on it. 
actually, I don't know any of those people. <laughs> I don't even know, like, I've heard of those people. You've probably seen that brown paint go over murals and it only doesn't make everybody happy. But this is a conversation that a neighborhood needs to have, right? It's like, what is public art that we need to preserve you know, and maybe there's something that, okay, maybe we, it's time for a change. Maybe we need to paint over it. So now, oh, yes. Oh, uh, Chloe, sorry, just to jump in. So one, one section that I didn't, you know, that we're not showing here right now, which is uh, extensively documented in the book is the uh, permission wall, wall uh, project Logan uh, on Fullerton and uh, Milwaukee. And, and that's such a great, great place where this ongoing, it gets, you know, where artists paint over the artists every month, there's a different artist, a different group of artists uh, getting to, to paint murals. Uh, and um, I think that's been just a, a treasure. And what, what's interesting about that part is it's, it's very um, temporary and, and it, just, it just keeps changing uh, as the neighborhood does. Mm -hmm. And that building is under threat. So it has been bought. So yeah. that might be a call to action for people. Find out like, what can you do if you, if you, and I think that that really is a gem, that building Project Logan, which is right across from Furious Spoon on Fullerton, um, it's next to Liberty Bank. I mean, that is a gem. And yeah, it's like, well, maybe we should do something if, if, if we think that that is one of the cultural treasures of Logan Square. It is the epicenter of, of street art, I think, in Logan Square. Um, I'm going to hand over to, I'm going to hand the mic, the imaginary mic over to an, it's just like one of your live lit events, <laughs> except half the audience is not wearing pants. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm just kidding. No, well. no, actually, I don't know. They may not be wearing pants. <laughs> anyway, Inez is going to read a section from the book. Now, we also have, Inez has interviewed, she interviewed over a hundred residents. I mean, at least a hundred, you know, and she did so much work on this book. Inez is a lead writer and she captured so many business stories. You know, one of the th great things about Logan Square is Logan Square is a great place for small business. It is a great place for family owned business, but also these are family owned businesses that, you know, they have, a, they've been here for decades and they have lessons. There's lessons that they learned, you know, that they're willing to share. And I'm so grateful that Torres Omar has shared their story with Inez. So she's gonna read, she's gonna read the passage, you know, from the book, you know, that 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 um, you know, that is the lead story for our business chapter. So go ahead, Inez. Thank you. Uh, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, I'm going to read this profile, and then I just wanna point out a few things about it because. I think it's, um, it reflects kind of a lot of the issues and the conversations that I had with all of these residents as I worked on the book. So I'll just begin. Um, the story of Torres Omar Jewelers begins with love at first sight. Jose Torres, a migrant worker from Guanajuato, Mexico, was making his way to a farm in Idaho when his Greyhound bus stopped in Chicago. He got off the bus, saw downtown Chicago, and fell in love, said his son, Pepe Torres Jr. He was homeless for a bit, and he didn't know the language very well. He had a cousin here, but it took him two days to locate him. Jose endeavored and eventually found at Torres Omar Jewelers, the family-owned business that has been a Logan Square fixture since 1994. Specializing in fine and custom jewelry, as well as jewelry repair, it boasts in-house experts who provide efficient service and can help clients design their own jewelry. It's a business that thrives on immigrant grit, generational ties, and community loyalty, but also sees continued success by adapting to the changes in Logan Square and in retail as a whole. Jose worked in a factory for many years before the family even dreamed of opening their own business. His wife, Maria, would often return from Mexico with religious medallions that she would sell to both her Latino and Polish neighbors. It prompted Jose to learn the trade from one of the few Hispanic jewelers op operating in the city at the time. There were a few failed attempts, but the family finally opened a shop in Lakeview in 1980. Pepe, after spending his childhood in the store, took over the business. He secured a second location in Logan Square in 1994 on a stretch of Milwaukee Avenue then populated with other Latinx jewelers. 
Now they are one of the few left and Pepe has passed on his legacy to his children, Cynthia, Joseph, and Crystal. The family attributes much of their success to their ability to adapt. Pepe took cues from Cynthia, the chief operating officer, and Joseph, chief marketing officer, on how to push the business forward. Cynthia had been working in the nonprofit sector, but, had, but kept working on the store on the weekends. Everything came full circle when I approached my dad. I was very honest with him. I told him I'm making good money, but I'm not happy. Cynthia took a leap of faith by returning to the family business and quickly began to implement a plan to bring new customers. Security requirements when the neighborhood was a little rough, and those were her words, uh, made the store less welcoming. The original storefront had small windows and only two of them displayed jewelry. An old black steel gate made it hard for passersby to see inside during off hours and a middle door made the entrance cumbersome. Realizing those security measures did not promote new business, Cynthia spearheaded the renovation. They installed floor to ceiling windows, replaced the floors, changed to LED lights and converted the back offices to include a front office and a private showroom. We are very proud to have a private showroom because that's helped us elevate our high-end retail clientele, says Cynthia. According to Pepe, hipsters will support small businesses. They'll be part of the culture and be part of the neighborhood. That's positive because we're getting that new market. Cynthia also worked closely with Joseph to introduce Torres Omar to a whole new corner of the world, the internet. They knew potential clients were only a click away. Their Instagram account at Torres Omar Jewelers showcases everything from classic gold rings to Catholic icon medallions, to stately watches, to quirky Super Mario Brothers pendants. With an eye to virality and an evidence of their exquisite craftsmanship, they've created a lot of buzz through clients like Jay Belvin, The Weeknd, Vic Mensa, and legendary boxing champ Julio Cesar Chavez. Throughout this though, they have refused to shy away from their Mexican heritage or turn their back on their Latinx customer base. They celebrate their heritage and designs inspired by Frida Kahlo, Gold Skulls, and the Mexican Eagle. They've been active supporters of immigrants' rights, providing scholarships to undocumented immigrants and making a point of supporting their immigrant network. Cynthia has been proactive about collaborating with other millennial-geared millennial Latinx-owned businesses through pop-ups, brand ambassadorships, and special events. Nevertheless, challenges have come with the rapidly shifting neighborhood. They own their building, but they worry about maintaining affordable housing for their tenants. Pepe, long disillusioned with neighborhood organizations and the politicking of community leaders backed away from formal networks of support. Cynthia has experienced positive direct relationships with other small businesses, but expressed dismay with how certain Logan Square businesses are excluded from what are supposed to be neighborhood wide events. They never talk to us, they never consider us. It's frustrating because we've been here for such a long time and they've only been here for a short amount of years. We would love to participate in those types of events, but they don't come to us. Both Pepe and Cynthia hope Logan Square can retain its unique culture and be a place where their customers feel welcome. Pepe feels optimistic that Torres Omar can remain successful in the neighborhood for the next 10 or 15 years. After that, Things that I have no control over, I don't worry, he says. Cynthia, a self-described planner, is more reticent. I would love to see Logan Square continue to prosper. I welcome new businesses. I just would like to see more collaboration among businesses of all realms, she said. She also believes stores should be allies to the more vulnerable members of the neighborhood. People have been here for a long time. They should be able to stay. Businesses should be a little more conscious of that. The pandemic hit the same year that Torres Omar planned on celebrating their 40th anniversary. Rather than rest on their laurels or decide to close shop, the Torres family did what they've always done during hard times, adapt and innovate. Some of their first steps were to double their marketing budget and revamp their website to make online ordering easier. They intensified their social media outreach. Pepe is now very comfortable with Facebook Live where he'll highlight new merchandise, host raffles and answer viewer questions. Their Instagram account has always had a good following, but instead of showcasing their high-end items, they're focusing more on what their regular clients may be seeking, like quinceañera sets and their very popular nameplates. The result, their online business is skyrocketing. The crisis hasn't been without its struggles, of course, but the family is confident they'll be able to weather it. It's a good reminder that we don't take anything for granted, said Cynthia, we just continue. 
And so one of the reasons why I really love talking to Torres Omar and also kind of what this profile shows is that um, there are a lot of complicated and nuanced takes when it comes to the issue of gentrification. And I think a lot of times in the media, we see it in, you know, in black and white or in complete binaries. People are either super pro or they're completely against. And what I discovered as I talked to more people is that most just had mixed feelings. Um, and especially when it came to the Latinx community, you know, a lot of them on the one hand had seen their neighbors move away. Uh, I saw a big divide between who stayed and who left depending on whether they were homeowners or if they had been renters that seemed to have been like the main differentiator. And, um, and they realized that there were a lot of changes. On the other hand, you know, they also said that they appreciated, for example, like the fact that it's safer now, the fact that now their trash is picked up. And of course, right, the answer to that isn't necessarily let's have more gentrification, but it's more um, the question of like, why wasn't city government doing that when it was a majority Latino neighborhood instead of waiting for when like white people showed up? And I think here too, you see a bit of a generational divide when I spoke and, you know, when I spoke to mostly, I would say like the older Latinx uh, generation, they almost seem to be a bit more chill and zen about gentrification. It almost seemed like they had, um, they had already been used to have like to the idea of having to move because of circumstances. So it almost seemed like they were a little less like emotionally invested um, about the idea of whether to stay or to go and, um, or at least had a more, if you wanna put it this way, practical view. But for example, when it came to talking to the younger generation like Cynthia, right? They seem to be way more aware of kind of the more underlying forces of gentrification, um, what the neighborhood risks losing if we just kind of let it go out of control. And, um, and, you know, and just one final thing on, on this story, it was really important, um, I, both to Chloe, you know, and to me that, uh, that we really talk about the Latinx community in Logan Square, not as a relic of the past and not as this like, and not only or solely as this demographic that was being pushed out, although of course that is, you know, a huge concern but there are still Latino neighbors and Latino businesses in Logan Square. They are still very much an active part of our present. And they are still, you know, have their eyes on being there in the future. And I think one of the discussions we should have as a community is, is precisely how we can help and support them so that they are our future. So thank you. Well said, Inez. My gosh, well said. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, Inez is a tremendously talented writer, guys. And just, you know, she has more, th she, she can talk a lot about like things besides gentrification, um, culture. She does a lot of food writing. So she also has of her many degrees. I think one of your degrees is in, because you have a degree in philosophy or something. And then also- Oh my God. <laughs> I have so many degrees, uh, but no, I, um, for a while I, I was getting a PhD in Latin American and Iberian cultures where I mostly focused on uh, the, the Latino culture in the US, so. <laughs> well, Latinx culture is your jam. <laughs> yep. But, but I think, yeah, so, so just in summary, um, you know, what are, so, I, think, I think that you know, the purpose of the book is, is to raise questions. Like one of the questions that you mentioned before is what makes a neighborhood? What are those things that we want to preserve, right? You know, also what agency do we have? You know, for things like Project Logan, you know, in the permission wall on Fullerton, it's like, yeah, it's like, can we do, you know, if this is something that we care about now that we know about it, we know it's like, wow, like the story behind it, you know, is there anything that we can do, you know, to preserve it? Maybe it is, we have to, maybe we're going to have to march down to the alderman's office, guys, <laughs> and say, hey, and actually there are some, there are some in the book, when we get into this, the street art chapter, there are some specific uh, recommendations, Ben Tanzer, 
who was one of the, the writers, the co-authors, had interviewed a number of these artists and curators. It's like, yeah, what if we had an ordinance that said a certain percentage of the budget for new development has to go to public art, right? You know, there are specific things that we can be. So, you know, I, I want people to think about this book almost as a sort of tool. It's like, oh yeah, that's a cool thing. Or I have like a special connection with the freeze, you know? It's like, if something were to happen that it changes owner or whatever, what agency do I have? Can I talk to the, uh, can I talk to community groups? You know, the churches. So David has spent a lot of time going into churches, photographing churches from the outside on very, 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 very cold days. <laughs> I don't wanna add. So has Severio. I was surprised how long these people can last, how long these photographers can last in the cold, still operating their cameras. But they do that because they want us to be thinking, you know, about it's like, wow, like this place I walk by, when I see the Meenenkirken, right, when I see that church, the Norwegian church, that tells me I'm home, right? I want to make sure that if that church needs money, actually it is raising money for its facade, yeah, that I, you know, know how I can contribute you know, to preserving those assets that are important to, to, you know, what makes Logan Square a great place to live, you know, and then also, so yeah, thinking about the places that connect people like the freeze, um, and also, yeah, it's like, so, um, you know, what does the neighborhood want, right, when we look at Milwaukee Avenue, I look at Milwaukee Avenue, and you know, it's like, I feel like these commercial corridors, you know, they're places where we feel like we can just fulfill every middle-class aspiration. We can go to Target, right? <laughs> and buy a new set of pots. And then I can go down the street to Sip of Hope and have a turmeric latte. And that's a, that sounds like a good weekend, <laughs> you know? But even that, you think about that, it's like, wow, it's like that diversity, maybe that is under threat, you know? And also there is a very important quote, one of my, one of my favorite quotes from the small business section, you know, is comes from Ann Kingsley, you know, and she says, and she owns the store called Play, Play Toys and Books, which is on uh, Milwaukee Avenue. It's uh, right by the farmer's market. If you go to the farmer's market on Sundays, and she says, you know what, the decisions that we make today can have a lasting impact on businesses. Our decision, our choice to support our local business today, right? Those actions, you know, today, and believe me, they need it more than ever. They can have lasting effects on those businesses and lasting effects on the community. So I think that's, you know, some, one of the quotes that I want to pull out. Well, that's my summary. And now I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it over to you guys. I wanna hand it over to you guys. Oh, the final image, I do wanna point out, Chicago Public Library Thursday Night Knitting Circle is, is just a fantastic gathering. They taught my daughter how to knit. <laughs> it's very, very social. It is a very, very cool thing. And it's just like, people just come and knit. You can crochet too. Just bring it, bring it, bring, bring your needles. But it's a really fun social gathering. So I want to say thank you to the Thursday Night Knitting Circle. But also let's, let's just open it up to you guys. So, you know, if you have some feedback, if you're like, hey, you know, this book made me, this is, remind me of this thing that used to happen in the neighborhood, or I want to see this continue, or this is my favorite building. So um, while the photographers, two of the photographers and writers, or actually three, Severio's here somewhere, three of the photographers are actually on this, two of the writers, Inez and, and Ben. So let's, let's hear your comments. So handing the mic over, my virtual mic. So if anybody wants to share something, you can just unmute, just reach over like to your keyboard. So Paul, thank you, Chloe, and thank you, um, Inez and, and Yurk and David for uh, being here. This is Shirley from the Logan Square Library. <clears throat> the Knitting Circle is online too now every Thursday night. But your book came in and it got checked out, sent out on hold, and it is now overdue. <laughs> Someone else waiting for it. <laughs> 
Thank you for generously donating a copy to us. It went out as soon as it made it into our catalog. <laughs> you could order it. And I really enjoyed looking through all the pages as quickly as I could because it had to leave the building so quickly. <laughs> Well, another copy is going to be donated to the Chicago Public Library. So, you know, supply will meet Thank demand. So We're make sure that market clears. <laughs> Paul, you want to say something? So, Paul's a longtime Logan Square resident. Sure, Chloe. You can you you can tell me. Uh, I I was sadly a little bit late uh, showing up. I got the the street art. Uh, chat from uh, Mr. Metzner, but um, there is a piece of street art that I, I didn't see in the book and, and maybe I just missed it somehow, but that is the mural uh, across from Haas Park, the, uh, the one that's on the wall of the Midas muffler shop. I know what you're talking about. It's an old mural. It's a it very old mural and, and it was actually the first piece of public art in Logan Square in 1976. It was painted by people from the neighborhood. And uh, that definitely is not one that should be painted over. Actually, it's been repainted at least once. Um, and it's, it actually has been, uh, photographed and appeared in, in a variety of books uh, and sort of represents our neighborhood in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would certainly hate to see it not make it to the list of things that we need to preserve. Well, David tried to take a photo of that. There was a Midas, there's the Midas shop, but it was very, right. very hard. There's trees. There was just too many elements in front it is a big, uh, it is a big piece, although uh, you may not be aware of what put it there. Back in the 70s, uh, that was a pretty dangerous block to be walking around on. And uh, with the help of what was then the Chicago Mural Group, the neighbors thought that uh, if we had the community, including some of the uh, uh, the young folks from the neighborhood participate in painting the thing that we could calm things down on that block. And frankly, it succeeded. Uh, yeah. It's one of the original questions was, well, why should we do that? As soon as we do it, it'll be all tagged and messed up. But that never happened. And it was clear because uh, of the folks that were involved in painting it. It wasn't just uh, it wasn't just uh, uh, John Weber. Uh, there were kids from the neighborhood were involved too. So I think that's. I'm glad that you bring that up, Paul, because the street art. Yeah, you know, we wanted to include that. We just could not get a good photo. We just could not that's, get a good. Yeah, but also, <laughs> but it raises, it, it raises this question of preservation because you. It's, it wasn't until a couple of, of years ago that the city of Chicago did have a registry for murals, for public murals. Because I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. during, you know, um, Mayor Daly, McMaggie Daly was just, just did not, she just was not down with street art, okay? <laughs> and this whole brownwashing, I call it brownwashing, but painting over murals, right, with brown paint. You know, mm. that basically took off under, maybe if somebody can correct me if it had happened before in previous, you know, like mayoral administrations, but there was basically a war on public murals. And so, mm. and the city never really had a definition of what is, a def what is the difference between graffiti and like street mm. art, what is a mural? And one of their definitions is anything that contains letters is graffiti. Well, by that definition, then, the most photographed mural in the city of Chicago would be considered graffiti because it contains the letters. <laughs> so make up your mind, guys. So, but this is a debate. And I think this is something that the public need, need to participate in because you think about every single surface in Logan Square, well, at Pilsen, in so many Chicago neighborhoods, 
they're covered with stickers and murals and signs and you know and i think it's i think it's beautiful it's a sign of vitality you know well you know maybe what we need is a community version of the bf ferguson fund uh you know the 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 uh the city does care for some of its art uh stuff and the ferguson fund lord i think that's probably a hundred years old it was endowed to uh maintain monuments and mm. now it's administered by the art institute but every time that the the monument gets tagged and it gets cleaned up that's being paid for by the bf ferguson fund mm -hmm. and i didn't know that mm. it's it's uh <laughs> they've got too much to do <laughs> but but yeah, this is something to bring up with our community organizations, right? This is something to bring up with our community organizations. So David, do you have something to say? They certainly I could say, I can't share my screen, but I was gonna say, for those of you who are curious, this is on my phone here. So this <gasps> yeah. is a photograph of a portion of that mural um, <laughs> that, uh, that Paul was just describing. And uh, it really is a remarkable, that's a remarkable mural. And it's one of the things that's so complicated about making a project like this is you want to include everything. Uh, but how do you make particular decisions about what to include and what not to include? But it's a remarkable site. I'm glad that I was able to get a chance to spend a lot of time with it, thinking about a way to make a, you know, make a representation that will, um, you know, that, that, that might or might not work with the text. Um, but um, anyway, it's remarkable. And I think it's yet another reminder of how um, conversations like this allow us to tease out not only neighborhood histories, but the meaning of history. And of course, we then see this conversation that's emerging, which is how do we preserve murals? How do we make sure that, uh, you know, the community ideals are expressed in relationship to them, right? And what might be the role of government be, or what might the role of government be in that whole process? And so, you know, I, again, I'm just really excited that, uh, that the book and a conversation like this uh, can emerge from this kind of context. Well, the, the idea of a community funded preservation endowment, if you will, uh, that particular piece of work was funded by people from the neighborhood. There, there was no grant from anybody to, to pay. We had to raise the money. I remember Jim Mulligan from over on uh, Kimball Avenue uh, going around with a cigar clenched in his, uh, between his teeth uh, with, a, with an empty coffee can at the, uh, the inaugural uh, event for it, shaking people down. <laughs> to help pay. And maybe that's, uh, you know, if nothing else, maybe we could somehow link the, uh, link the fund to that, that uh, mural, which, by the way, has been repainted at least once, maybe twice, with funding from, I, I think, from the city. I think that's where the mural group or the Chicago Art Public Art Project has gotten its cash. Anyway, yes. Um, all right, I'm, I've done my good deed. We've preserved the, uh, we've we've kept the profile of uh, together. We preserved the community up. Yeah, I wanted to, <laughs> to jump in there. Robert. Hey, Robert. <laughs> hey, Robert. Um, um, actually, I was going to say I grew up in that neighborhood. I grew up on Tallman, across from Gaithy uh, Playground, and that actually was one of the first murals I ever knew about in the neighborhood and. You know, like Paul, I'm glad that it's been saved and, you know, it's been kept. One of my, you know, saddest moments, I remember when there was another community mural that went up um, near the Logan Square McDonald's um, on the wall facing the parking lot that I always thought was an amazing mural. And sadly, that one somehow got painted over. So I, I, I think, you know, the idea of preserving murals is a good one. Um, one of the things that I... I mean, I grew up in Logan Square on Tallman Avenue, and I remember when there were actual hot houses in the playgrounds. Darwin had a hot house, Brentano had a field house, Gacy had a field house, and we used to have sports teams, and we would compete in the neighborhood. And I remember, you know, there was, you know, usually some tension between Has Park and Gacy Playground. You know, Has Park was a park district, and JC was a Chicago public school playground. And I remember one summer 
the athletic director at Gacy decided to have a summer softball league. And so we actually played teams from Hass Park. And that was one of the ways that we helped ease some of the tensions between parts of the community was through that athletic competition. Mm -hmm. And I really missed the field houses that used to be in Logan Square. And I thought they were an important part of offering activities for um, children after school. So I just wanted to throw that in there. And just for folks who may not know, I'm active with Unity Park Advisory Council and I'm active with that council because I grew up knowing what it was like to have a playground. And I realized how you know big of an asset a local playground is for the community. So just wanted to add that in there. And, and like I said, that is one of my favorite murals. I think it's called Full Tilt. I'm not tilt. Sure. Oh. Yeah, tilt is tilt is the name of the piece. That's the, the shorthand name for it. Yeah, I know what you're talking. You're gonna know what you guys are talking about. Well, let's hear from some more people. So anybody who's grown up in the neighborhood who wants to share some of you know the places that you feel a strong connection to. Oh, can I give a shout out to Fabrio for the wonderful Lisa Libre? Oop, I didn't hear I didn't hear that, Robert. What was that? Robert, did your cat walk across your pooter? <laughs> oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, I, I just wanted to give a shout out to Savrio for the wonderful Lucha Libre picks that are in the book. I, I, I think they're amazing yes, and they're I'm glad. Good. Yes. Yeah, I think that for some people, the Lucha Libre. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the highlights for them in the book. But yeah, we've got the Social Justice Movement Church, Darwin Elementary, and then parks. You've got this whole section about the stuff that happens in our community gardens, Palmer Square, you know, stuff that happens on the street, on the boulevards. And uh, yeah, let me just fast forward to the Lucha Libre. And thank you. So oh, this is a movie in the park, Unity Park. Oh, that's from Lucha Libre, sorry. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, yeah. Do you guys notice these people? I got a feeling they look like that like 24 <laughs> seven. That's not a costume for some of these people. This woman, Paloma Star, oh my gosh. She had so many fans. Let me tell you, she had so many fans and these kids, and this, this is the thing, it's like, the impact on these kids, right? This is why people keep coming to Unity Park and it's free, this stuff is free. So yeah, it's like if people wanna preserve these activities, that's the thing is like there's cost. There's, these are high quality events, like very, very high quality events that the Unity Park Advisory Council puts on. I would like to say like Unity Park Advise, that is one of the most high performing nonprofits that I have ever seen. Seriously, it's all volunteer run and they get it done. Lucha Libre. Thank you. Yes, no, I'm serious. And I've seen a lot of nonprofits, but you guys creating events that's accessible to everyone that are well publicized, high quality and original. This was the only Lucha Libre that happened in, it was like 2019? Yeah, that was the only Lucha Libre that happened that year, right? In the Chicago Park District. Is that correct, Robert? I believe so, yeah, 2019. Isn't that cool? And that's in Logan Square. That's like people, volunteers in Logan Square, just like, you know, just getting it done. Yeah, and, and sadly, more? yeah, sadly, one of the luchadores, Iceman Tim Norton, recently passed away and he'd been participating since the inaugural Lucha Libre, so. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Well, I'm, I'm glad that we were able to document so much of the event. And um, yeah, those are amazing pictures. It's from Severio, Severio Trulia. Okay, let's hear some more feedback from people. Yeah, snaps to Severio. Like anybody else wanna share like what's like their the favorite part, the favorite aspect of of the neighborhood you guys actually you guys, Chloe, yes oh sorry chloe no just to kind of piggyback a bit on these um unity park events we've seen and 
you know, the pictures we've seen of families. Um, I covered a lot of these kind of family friendly events when working on the book. And one of the things that I heard over and over again, especially from, you know, BIPOC parents um, was that the reason they moved to Logan Square or wanted to stay in Logan Square was because it was one of the few neighborhoods in Chicago that they felt where families like them were kind of the norm, you know, where they felt like they could see a wide diversity of people. And it was something that was important to them, especially in terms of raising their children. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just throwing that in there, you know, because um, I'm so like appreciative of how candid people were on this subject. And uh, especially, you know, like, um, I remember specifically a biracial couple that I talked to in the Halloween parade. And I don't even know how we got to this point, you know, but um, that was that was one of the reasons why they bought, I don't know if they bought property, but why they made it a point to move to Logan Square when they decided to have kids. And it's because like, they did not want to be in a neighborhood considering how segregated Chicago is where they mm -hmm. would be seen as like the different family. Mm -hmm. um, so just throwing that in there. That's right. Everybody is welcome. Everybody is welcome. There's like no such thing as like normal. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like you just come as you are. But yeah, these are portraits from Severio, the Latin American Motorcycle Association. Um, yeah, so they let us in. Inez, do you have like a favorite? Because you interviewed, you spent some time at Long. I did. They were, they were just like the nicest people. <laughs> they are all teddy bears inside. It is <laughs> like the most welcoming. Uh, I think it was one of the most fun nights I had um, uh, working on, on this book. Mm -hmm. so. And it's uh, people of all ages. It's cool. It's like all ages, all backgrounds. They just share a love of bikes and uh, they own the building. They're right next to Park and Field and the beers are way cheaper than Park and Field. <laughs> way cheaper, way cheaper. <laughs> just so you know. Oh my gosh, but this is Tito. He's the president and uh, just some other regulars. I love this guy holding up his plate of food. Cause like, <laughs> just like, just like, he's like, yeah, this is how I'm gonna spend my evening. I know you want some, but it's mine. <laughs> I know this this gentleman here who's just standing like just like full on. It's like I feel like he's almost statuesque, you know. There's something that's just very, just very elegant about that. It's just like no, he's just perfectly still and he's just comfortable how he is and this is how he's presenting himself. He's from in the Llama chapter in Dallas. Let's hear from some more people. Let's get some feedback. So anyone wanna share their memories or, you know, if you're, here's a Halloween parade. I love these photos. This is Severio and Robin Marchant and I'm kind of freaked out, but at the same time, this is Logan Square. So like, I'm kind of amused and I also wanna call the cops at the same time, that's Logan Square. Oh, yeah. And these people here, I mean, they could just be like just residents and they just happen to walk through the, the park and they'd be like, hey, what are all these people doing in our neighborhood? <laughs> that would be totally normal. And in case you guys did not know, Jason Hamill and Lula Cafe, they have been part of the Halloween parade since its inception baking ginger snap cookies, serving up hot apple cider since the Logan Square Halloween parade began. Um, yeah, oh, Claw at the Logan Square Auditorium. So I thought that was really interesting. Actually, Inez, do you wanna say something? Cause you were there that night and you interviewed people. That was kind of a strange night, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was. Um... Yeah, so a lot of this is uh, a fundraising event for a theater here in Chicago. And um, and so the competition, let's say it's uh, it's it's staged to a degree, you know, there uh, <laughs> it's not really about necessarily who wins the arm wrestling and who doesn't. But one of the things that I found really 
the interesting was that each of the people that participated as an arm wrestler had kind of created their own persona, you know? And, um, and this, uh, they were very vocal about kind of the political issues that were important to them. Um, and they usually incorporated that in their performance, like here with Cap Capitan Filipina, um, you know, who very much stood for immigrant rights. And the event itself, as silly as it may sound, you know, you have a bunch of like grown-ups in all these ridiculous costumes uh, doing armor wrestling and so on was very political from the get-go you know it began with like um the star spangled banner but like most sporting events but with many audience members taking the knee in solidarity with Colin Kaepernick and the Black Lives Matter movement um there was a whole uh, manifesto about consent at the beginning which was done in a way that was really fun and really humorous and totally age appropriate, but, um, but, you know, but that really highlighted kind of the issue um, surrounding personal boundaries, surrounding, you know, body boundaries and all that. It felt, and, very, um, scripted. It felt very scripted, like contrived, like we're, this is a very scripted, contrived weirdness and, you know, overt, you know, politicization, you know, and it was like, it's almost like they're trying really, really hard to be of the moment you know, to connect, to meet the moment. You know, that's how I felt. That's how I felt. So, but I, I, I kind of felt like this might be a sign of sort of like this sort of decline where it's like, the sort of like, we're sort of like one, like the first derivative of weirdness in Logan Square. We're now like to like first derivative weirdness, if that makes sense. You guys all study calculus, right? <laughs> <laughs> I never got past first derivative. But I think, yeah, we get to third derivative, second derivative, that's upside down world. But anyway, but yeah, but it was just felt very kind of like weird in a contrived way. It was very scripted, but I think for some of the people who participated, they really did see it as kind of a way to perform their own concerns, you know? And um, I mean, I think where like the contrived part comes from, I think depends a lot on like who attends, like who the audience is that might just be there kind of for the spectacle of it and ignore all of this. But I think for some of the performers, they felt it was like their way of really expressing themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's definitely like a super like extremely on brand millennial hipster, we are artsy, you know, type of performance. Very self for sure. this kind of artsiness. Very self. Yeah. This is the best, best Thursday night knitting circle in the entire city, guys, right? Happening right here at Chicago Public Library. Oh no, they brought food. <laughs> oh, don't tell anyone. I think I brought that bag. I definitely brought those Twinkies, but that's <laughs> like my signature move. Yay. Hey everyone, I just wanted to uh, just hey. uh, share. Hey everyone, uh, I'm uh, I'm Danny. I'm the principal of uh, Darwin Elementary, I, and so uh, I just want to say first off, thank you to everyone who who stopped by and visited. Um, Chloe also uh, donated some books to our staff, uh, and you know we we haven't been in community with one another for quite some time. And so I really wanted to share just the reaction of a multitude of people gathering around opening this book. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as we, we laid out the books and uh, my custodian turned to the page, uh, my, one of my staff members who's, uh, who's our dean uh, started to turn to a page and, and you notice that everyone found themselves at different pages of the book. And so uh, one of my teachers was, was really looking at some of the foodie aspects and, and kind of chiming in with another staff member. Um, one of our staff members is an associate pastor and, and he called his buddy and said, hey, I, you know, I got a picture of you, um, you, know, you know, standing in the congregation. Um, and then my custodian was like, hey, look, there's some Mexicans here. And, and so uh, jokingly, but, um, but speaking his truth, right? Um, and so, that is what this book I saw firsthand do in, in response to, in the emotions it, it raised. 
And so, David, you David, you mentioned with your uh, with your tasty freeze uh, portrait that you had to wait for the rain to be present in order for that picture to glow. And that really resonated with me with what this book is. It's coming at a time when there's a lot of rain and it's showing and, and it's glowing what we represent and who we are as a collective, a Logan Square. Mm -hmm. And so um, I thought that was very fitting and, uh, and you all did a phenomenal job. And it's great to see Paul, you, know, you may not remember me, but I've been in meetings with you. And uh, Chloe, I'm really impressed with, uh, with your just your historical knowledge of just policy and background of just the minutia of like, you know, graffiti blasters and, and uh, these types of things. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm really thankful for all of your efforts in, in putting this together because it means a lot to a lot of people in different ways. And we're going to continue to uh, hand out the books as our staff begins to scaffold back into the building. Um, and so I really wanted to share that with you all, uh, that it means something to a lot of people. And so I, I, I hope that you all um, really take that away from, from this today. Thank you so much for sharing that. So yeah, so you know, over 30,000 images were collected and these photographers, I mean, the writers, you know, I mean, they work a lot of hours getting these stories down. But I think also another thing that's really important is understanding the context, you know, and what does it mean? Like, so um, Robin and Severio and Inez, you know, we spent a whole day at Darwin Elementary. And let me tell you, I was so impressed with those kids because Darwin, that's where you, they, they teach leadership, you know, like from day one, like pre-kindergarten, these kids are up there and they are leading <laughs> this little one. I was just so impressed. And, you know, I think it was really, it's and just, we tried to capture so much of what happens at Darwin Elementary in the school and just how immersive. And, you know, I understand why like families like, yeah, it's like, we need to get these kids back in the school. You know, and one of the reasons, because you look at this environment, you know, I mean, the learning isn't just, there is that, we're trying to like show people, it's like, yes, there's this context of, you know, all this information that's on the walls and all the activities and all the, the things that, they, that students, just the stuff that's like, this is like their maker's lab, you know, just like these rooms full of stuff where keep, kids can just put like both things together. Um, and the music and there's performance and there's culture. And I think one of the things, one of my favorite quote uh, from Principal De Las Reyes is, you know what the, 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 the value, right? This is what diversity is, this is what biculturalism is. It is seeing the value in everyone. You know, it is seeing the value in everyone. And I think that when we walk around and you look at these buildings, you look at the street art, like there's no such thing, there should be no such thing as high art, high architecture and low art, you know, low architecture. Why don't we elevate all histories? Why don't we elevate our cultures? And if we have this philosophy, yeah, it's like the art along the Bloomingdale Trail or Project Logan. You know, you know what? Actually, one of the 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 the, the, the curators at Ben Tanzer in interview, she's like, there are more people who pass by Project Logan and those permission walls than people who go into the Art Institute. You think all the people who walk by? There are more people who see these murals, like Jason Brander, Brammer's Octopod, you know, or the one that's on, you know, across from Haas Park that are going to go into the gallery. So maybe we should preserve them. So, so thank you so much, Principal De Los Reyes, for sharing that. Any other reactions, comments, feedback before we wrap up? Anyone else? Can I hear from some of the other team members? If any other team members want to share one of their highlights, one of their favorite moments. Ben, Tanz, are you still there? I love talking. I had never written before about street art. Like that didn't stop me from putting a whole chapter together on space. Like nothing's going to stop. Nobody's going to tell me what I can't do. I'm going to write this whole thing. <laughs> and I'm glad I am I here. 
<laughs> hey, there's Ben. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, it was an honor to be part of the book. And of course, as long as I've been in Chicago, I was hanging out in Logan Square, particularly as a writer. Um, but what I was going to say, could you ask any other, you know, one of the real highlights for me was having lunch with Flash ABC, um, who, you know, to me is a true legend and icon of the Chicago, of Chicago street art. But, you know, yeah. I uh, very much appreciated being part of the project. And I think the thing I had to fight against most was just, you know, being such a fanboy the whole time, which I tend to be anyway, but then, you know, for you to push me out there to talk to Flash or Sam Kirk, you know, all these really wonderful artists doing street art and murals and, you know, again, having lunch with Flash was possibly the highlight because he also really schooled me. I'm a native New Yorker, but having him talk about the influence of New York street art and hip hop and fashion and how that came to Chicago and how they used that and how they drew on artists from the West Coast and all these other places to do their work. It was um, it was very exciting and very humbling. And, uh, you know, I'm honored to be part of it. And the book, of course, is absolutely stunning. So that didn't, doesn't surprise me in the slightest, but um, you know, all these good photographers, all these good street art, all these good writers, very cool thing, Chloe. Thrilled to be part of it. Well, thank you for sharing, but yeah, so, so uh, Flash, he's also uh, behind uh, the all women wall, all women uh, uh, um, artist uh, mural, uh, the, um, the Bloomingdale Trail, at the Kimball underpass. A lot of those artists came at the invitation of Flash but yeah, I mean, he's, and you know, a lot of these artists, you know, they're either doing it for free, um, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're paid something, but not a lot. And it's really important that we offer, you know, our continued support, whether it's on a policy level, making sure these murals get in the registry, um, you know, or like working with organizations to put some money to, to preserve um, some of this public art. Um, and then also, um, just so people know, um, LGNSQ, if you haven't bought your copy of the book, um, you can go to LGNSQ, you can get a discount with the code 35, enter code 35 for the $35 discounted price. Also, another thing, you can sign up for our mailing list because we are planning on more stuff. There is going to be a massive, massive, massive public art installation happening in June. I'm not gonna tell you what it is, you're just gonna have to guess, but it's gonna be two blocks long and it's gonna blow your mind. Anyway, <laughs> so you should sign up for the mailing list on LGNSQ to find out more. And also it's like, yeah, if you wanna have a community discussion, maybe we can talk some more about street art. We can talk about you know, some of the architecture, some of the churches, what can we do to preserve our churches? Right, that's hat. Like churches are being converted to other things. Do we like it? How do we feel? You know, should we talk to the aldermen about this? Um, and then finally, I want to thank the Chicago Public Library. Chicago Public Library, Shirley Lee. I want just a special shout out to you because you've been very, very supportive to me, especially for the past ten years, hosting my financial literacy events at the library and just having such great programming all year long even during this pandemic because the library is it is our community center right everybody is welcome it is our community we need that library we need our libraries you know so badly especially in times when people are looking you know to make connections when the stores are closed the library has been open so thanks everyone for coming you know thanks to our speakers and uh, sign up for the mailing list. And I hope that for the next event, I get to see you all in person. <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Modern Capital Concepts. Thank you, photographers, writers. What a <laughs> tremendous undertaking. And Chloe and, and everybody, you helped bring all these people to the library who who haven't been able to come in because of the pandemic, but we are open business as usual, kind of, sort of. So we're, we're really happy to see everyone who makes their way in. Well, thanks again, Shirley. And everyone have a great evening, stay warm and stay safe. All right, bye. <laughs> Thank you everyone.